the, 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 basically, in talking to Zach, stopped by the officer. He's, he's ahead of schedule, which is a good, it's a good sign. And then uh, Akil Lynch had a really good off season. So obviously he's he's going to play for us. Billy, uh, you know, was was struggling uh, a little bit academically. So what I did was in the second summer session, I basically wanted him to concentrate on academics. So he would get his his workouts in early in the morning or kind of later at night. But the primary goal was to to be able to do well academically so that he could be eligible. And I, I believe he's you know, going to be eligible until I get that on a piece of paper. So it's those three guys, and then uh, Pat Zerby, Dominic, Dominic Salomon will be you know, play fullback. Zerby will be our fullback when we use the fullback. And you know, there's not a lot of depth there, you know, but uh, we're gonna have to do a good job in training camp with rotating those guys in and making sure that you know, like I've said about just about every position, is keeping them healthy. What do you think you know for sure about that? Um, you know, I would say, you know, by the first week of training camp, in, during the first week of training camp, and, and I think he's going, you know, I don't want to make a mountain out of a mole over there. I believe he's going to be fine. He's doing very well. Is there anybody else kind of in that same situation? Or is he no. No, Felder. Felder was a was a guy that needed to have a good summer academically, and he has. He has. Now we we you know it's funny you know you always talk about the guys you know a little bit that are maybe struggling. You know, we, Ninety-eight percent of these kids are doing doing great, which is a testament to, to those kids and our academic staff. And, you know, we had fifty kids last semester have over three hours. Coming back from the NFL. Was it a readjustment for you to have to kind of still focus in on all the academic stuff? Yeah. Because, yeah. I think you have to. One thing I'm, I've tried to do a better job of in my second year, you know, after the season ended, is to organize my day a little bit better. So, you know, football, recruiting, academics, uh, basically injury reports or medical uh, issues. That's kind of how I. Doing marketing, <laughs> you know, all the different things, and I try to have a checklist and, and think about the night before what I'm going to do the next day. And, but when you've never, when you've never done it as a head coach, you're, you're definitely learning on the job. And I learned a lot my first year. What else, what else did you learn? I mean, yeah. Um, well, I, I learned a lot about the players very, very quickly. You know, when you're when you're a coordinator or you're a position coach, you just You've got your own little bubble world there that you're worried about, and and uh, when you're a head coach, now you've got 100 some odd kids. So I learned a lot about the players. Um, I really that's my favorite part of the job is the players. So I know the players a lot better. Uh, learned a lot about organization and how important it is to just basically state your philosophy, your goals. Just about every day, or every time you have a staff meeting, so that your staff understands where we're headed. We're always pointing in the same direction. I don't think you can say those types of things enough. You know, we want to be a, a tough, smart football team. We want good kids. Um, you know, we, we want to be able to play in all kinds of weather, all those different things. You know, we, they talk about that a lot, you know, whether it's recruiting or X's and O's. So I've learned to, I think, communicate that too. You said yesterday you were in a much better mood than you How much difference is it? Yeah, I mean, yes. Yeah, I mean, uh, a year ago, we had just found out about the sanctions. So that was a tough time. That was a time when uh, we had just received, in many ways, some, as far as I'm concerned, some unexpected news. We knew there was something coming down the pike, but, and so that was coming. And then I'm coming to my first Big Ten media days as a head coach. That's top of all that. So I think we've we've learned a lot in the year. I, I believe we've improved. The years ahead are aren't going to be easy, but uh, we have a better handle on things. We're more comfortable with, with each other, players and coaches, coaches and coaches, uh, administrators and coaches. So 
you know, I think I think I'm just more, more comfortable this year. Whether that leads to victories and all these other things, who knows? I just know that uh, I made a lot of mistakes and I've learned from the mistakes. A lot was made. You were you quite a senior class last year that kind of helped you through that. I mean, it's, those guys are gone now. I mean, do you feel like you still have that leadership around? That can... Yeah, that's college football. You know, those guys, the class has graduated. It's not like you have Tom Brady who's been there 13 years and, you know, he's um, setting the tone in your locker room. You have a, a definite cycle of seniors graduating. So, excuse me, we, we feel really good about our leadership. You know, the three guys I brought here with me uh, these two days, uh, Urshel, Carson, and Willis, great locker room guys, uh, tough players. Uh, and, you know, we have leaders in other classes, too. So we have you know, Allen Robinson, is obviously a leader for us. So, uh, and, and there's guys like Ty Howell, who, you know, we don't talk about that much, who's going to be our starting center, who's definitely a leader. So we, we feel good about our leadership. As far as transition, what came the easiest to you? Or maybe the hardest thing you didn't expect. Well, the football end of it for me is what I'm early on is what I'm most comfortable with. You know, the X's and O's, and then you know the things that that were more difficult were you know, all the other things that you don't deal with as an assistant coach. The marketing end of it, the, the medical issues that crop up, the different personal issues that come up with coaches and players. And, you know, there's a lot of traffic through your office. You're, you're an assistant coach. They're not coming through your office. So I tried to you know, think about it, take a you know, ready aim fire approach instead of a ready fire aim approach, and, and uh, try to get better with those types of things. Be organized. So I think I'm, you know, much improved than I was when I first took the job. What about the politics for the school and what's been swirling around the program? I, I know you've tried to maybe cut some of that out, but just in terms of, and I'm sorry I'm behind you, just in terms of, uh, as an unexpected thing that you had to deal with, how do you sort of see that? Well, so, so, you know, certainly, um, you know, a lot of things have happened in our program since I took the job, and obviously before I took the job. And the number one goal for me is to keep our players and, and staff focused on the things that we can control. And what can we control? Well, we can control how we play. We can control how we work out, how we scheme things, uh, what we do in the community. Um, obviously, how we go to class, how we do in school. All those other things, we really can't control. Now, when I'm asked questions, at times I'll, I'll, I'll give my opinion, but right now, I'm so focused on the 2013 season, I'm not, I don't really care about it. I know my job is to go out here and do the best job I can to keep this team focused on training camp and how, how much would it help you, though, if sort of everyone at Penn State is on the same page with the surroundings? I don't, you know, I, I really, at the end of the day, it does not affect the 2013 team, and that's what I'm focused on is the 2015 team. Well, you talked about learning from mistakes. Could you give us yeah. some examples of Sure. So, say, for instance, on game day, doing a better job, you know, uh, managing the clock before halftime. You know, maybe there were a couple games where I could have used our timeouts a little bit better to, to give us a chance to have a two-minute drive to maybe kick a field goal before halftime or end-of-game situations or just call some better plays uh, because I'm communicating better with the guys in the press box, you know, this year. Um, Practice-wise, just really doing a better job this year of gauging what our team needs on a week-to-week -week basis. You know, who are we playing? Okay, we're playing a team that plays a bunch of man-to-man -man coverage. Right? We, we need a lot of a lot more man-to-man -man coverage in practice this week. Or, you know, just just be on top of that a little bit. So, um, you know, football-wise, that those are things. Recruiting-wise, you know, just and I think this is myself and our staff just doing. It as good a job as we can do of background checks and, and making sure we know what these kids are all about to the best of our ability. You know, it's not an exact science, but trying to make sure we know. Um, you know, the other thing that that I that I look at too is, um, uh, you know, I don't know how to say this, but like in team meetings, I'm going to bring in a couple more guest speakers to talk to these guys that have been through some things. You know, maybe it's drugs and alcohol or social media or, or uh, 
you know, things that, that, that college kids go through and, and let the kids listen to a couple different voices. So I've, those are things that I just want to do, keep, keep it moving, always try to improve and, you know, obviously never ever be satisfied with where you're at, just try to get better. Bill, I think it was in the spring and you talked about practices, uh, keeping up the intensity but not having quite as much hitting. Uh, how is that going like, to play out in the fall? I think as you mentioned, it's the you know, roster size is not quite as large. How will that play out over like a full fall type of uh, season? Will you continue to kind of have that uh, strategy of sorts in practice? Right. You, you have to do a good job. You know, Penn State right now, you know, we'll have 66 kids on scholarship. We'll have a, you know, just under 40 run-on players. So... What we need to do is make sure that our best players are healthy on Saturday. Like, so that's the goal. Because you know, pra you know, practice is practice, but you, 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 know, you have to make sure that you're putting your best team out there on Saturdays. Injuries are going to happen. You can't. It, it's, a, it's a violent sport and it's going to happen. So what are you going to do to control those things? Well, Number one is you have to gauge the health of your football team on a daily basis. Okay, these guys are pretty banged up. Let's have a walk through here instead of a, you know, a bloodbath. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, or these guys are, you know, they're pretty fresh. Things are going good in training camp. Hey, let's let's have a 50-play scrimmage, not a 100-play scrimmage, like you know, like you could have at some of these other schools. Let's have a 50-play scrimmage. And maybe the starters only go for like 15 plays and get them out, get the younger guys in there. So it's it's just an ongoing process of evaluating where we're at as a team. Have you been able to draw, have you been able to get input from like any other programs or, or from your professional uh, career, uh, like like how to practice like in this way? Or are you kind of going from uh, trying firsthand? Well, I have a lot of experience. You know, I have a lot of experience with the 53-man roster. In professional football, yeah. 53 on the active roster and eight practice squad players. You have 61 total players in the NFL. So I, you know, I, I obviously I use my experience at New England and, and how Coach Belichick did did things at New England practice wise. And, and uh, you know, I think that's basically what I base my experience on, or base my my philosophy on when it comes to a limited roster. Well, how's the transition going for John Butler, especially in the spring? What, did he, what maybe did he pick up over the spring? That sort of ended up? Yeah, John, that was a very smooth transition. John is a very quick-minded guy, very bright guy, intense. Players have a lot of respect for him. He's got a unique ability to be able to communicate to a player very quickly and not a long, drawn-out speech. And he can communicate to a player with the language that they use on defense very, very fast. And, uh, and a lot of that's because of his own intelligence and his knowledge of the defense. And he, he'll, he'll, do, he'll do a heck of a job. He's a, you know, I think, uh, I think the world is on. Does having Rutgers now in the league next year help you trying to move east to recruit east? To sure. Get, you know, yeah, I think, you know, I think I was saying this last night, to some, um, we, we had a dinner with some alums and uh, trying to raise some money. And uh, <laughs> so I was talking to them about the Big Ten in our meeting with Jim Delaney yesterday. You know, it's kind of interesting. Now you, now in the Big Ten you have uh, Nebraska, which borders Colorado. So you go all the way out to you know, the border of Colorado. Then you, you go to the border of Canada with Michigan. And you have the East Coast with Rutgers and Maryland. So you've got a pretty pretty neat little corridor there that makes the Big Ten a national, definitely a national conference now, more so than it was uh, before Maryland and Rutgers and we were in there. We, we've always, I believe, recruited well in the, in the Baltimore, D.C., New Jersey area. So I think it can only help us to be down there now to tell a young man, hey, look, we're going to play, you know, every other year we're going to be maybe at M&T Bank Stadium in Baltimore or Bird Stadium in College Park or down playing Rutgers, uh, you know, in New Jersey. So I think it, I think it can only help our, our, you know, our whole recruiting and, and our conference. If the league as a whole, it seems like New York is that, that's an untapped market college football right. wise. Is, is putting a flag there significant? You think? I think there's the definite significance there. I think as you as you look at the landscape of college football now, it's you know there's no real totally regional, you know, if you look at the SEC, they have Texas now, you know what I mean, you, you look at, um, you know, the Big Ten, like I just said, you're all the way out there in Big 12 country now, and, and, and you know, you can use examples with the ACC, you know, they have Pitt now, and, uh, 
So, I, and, and they're in Boston. So I think if, if, you, if you can do a great job of promoting our conference, like you said, putting the flag in the ground in New York, I think that's great for our conference. And I think as coaches, we're going to help Jim, Jim Delaney do that. Well, every kid's, every kid's different, but <clears throat> summarize what kind of reception you generally receive from the groups that you've been there. Right. We, we, um, first of all, we have a very good recruiting staff. We, we have all the guys on our staff are really solid recruiters, and and so the parents really are impressed with our staff. Then what I've found, and I found this out pretty quickly, is that when you when you get a young man on campus, it's it's such a fantastic place. I mean, we've got a hundred hundred thousand seat stadium. Uh, you've got. 40,000 undergraduate students, great student body, you've got weight room, it's second to none, you have great food, you have good living arrangements, the setting, and the mountains, you know, you, you guys have stood on our practice field, you know, that's a pretty neat place to practice, you've got the mountains in the background, I mean, not that you're staring at the mountains when you're trying to, you know, block the guy across from you, but the point is, when, when we get them on campus, we found that we, we, are, we are definitely in the hunt, and a lot of times we, we uh, we're able to, to get a commitment from, from that guy. And so it's a process, and you like to get them on campus to a game, and to a practice, and to a junior day, and three or four times, and then hopefully they're ready to make a decision. Recruiting, I'll say this, recruiting is about a fit. You know, I just I was talking to Jerry Kill about this yesterday. You know, recruiting, if the guy comes to Penn State and he feels like he fits there, and he's looked at all these other, all these schools are fantastic. I don't know these kids like if he fits and he feels comfortable, that's a lot to do. Yeah, I think because when you talk about mismatches, usually you're talking about the inside of the coverage. So you have you know a really good quick tight end or quick slot receiver matched up on a Mike linebacker. You know, he's a Mike linebacker. He's there to stop the run, not to defend the pass. You know, so you have a, a more of those on the inside of the defense where the tight ends usually are, the slot receivers usually are. But then you also have matchups like in the red area. On the outside, when you take a guy like Kyle Carter, put him out there on a five foot eight corner, throw him a hook shot, and let him go up and jump up and get him. You know, just physics. He's taller than that guy. So, uh, yeah, you, there's definitely some matchups for that position.